so I wanted to give him a real platform today because he's one of the pioneers of the whole CRISPR movement. And we're going to learn about some really interesting aspects that you won't hear anywhere else. Thank you, Rudolph. All right, great. So, so we've heard about data, and I'm going to put a different ingredient and different spin on it today. So it's all about data. It's all about drugs. It's all about diagnostics. Um, but at the same time, we're witnessing one of the most compelling, most timely, most impressive technological changes and revolution that we've seen in a long time. So I feel compelled to talk about CRISPR and essentially uh, address how the world of CRISPR and the world of data and diagnostics and drugs have been maybe touching for a while. And I think we're past the stage of overlap now to where there's a significant level of overlap that is enabling people who look at genetic data all day long to now not just look at it, not just analyze it, but actually modify it, change it, and alter it in what's been called the genome editing CRISPR-fueled craze. So um, the, the first issue when you start drawing circles like this is you make the assumption that the circles are the same size. And notwithstanding how attractive CRISPR is, I'm going to argue that the world of big data is much bigger than that of CRISPR, and that in many ways the world of genomic data has been engulfing the world of CRISPR. And, and I think we're here to have a dialogue between the, the data people, the genomic data people, and trying to forecast the future of drug diagnostics and big data. But at the same time, CRISPR is one of those tools that enables us not just to understand the data, but also change genetic data. So I think one of the things that was discussed today was how the genome is static and how diseases like DMD, which I'll feel compelled to talk about today, uh, uh, are challenging and difficult to address. But we now have technologies just before us that enable us to rewrite that genetic data. So I'll talk about gene therapies and actually change the data, notwithstanding the, the, the general concept that more often than not, the genome is indeed static but can be altered. So I'm going to try to walk you through genomes, and then genomes begot CRISPR, and then CRISPR begot genome editing, and so on and so forth, and try in the next 20 minutes to, to give you five distinct CRISPR-based vignettes of how CRISPR is a technology that enables us to impact data and drugs and diagnostics. So let's start with genomes. So, so CRISPRs, Actually, CRISPR is seen as a genome editing technology, but CRISPRs themselves are not genome editing machines. They've been repurposed as genome editing machines. Uh, but CRISPR is actually an acronym that stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. They're very peculiar genetic loci in the genomes of almost 50% of bacteria and about 90% of archaea. And essentially, they come from genomic data mining. And as the 90s occurred and early 2000s occurred, people repeatedly, no pun intended, observed CRISPR-Cas systems in, in the genomes of those beautiful organisms. And it's data analytics. It's actually looking at data all day long before the tools were there to do it that enabled us to observe, and others, obviously, to observe, discuss, and characterize CRISPRs. And this is what CRISPRs look like. This is a beautiful CRISPR. If you don't look at CRISPR all day, this is what you should be seeing. And in the uh, NC State red spirit, this is what CRISPR actually looks like in big data. It's a clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeat locus. So you have very short DNA repeats that are about 30 to 36 nucleotide long. They are directed repeats, obviously. They're partially palindromic. The five prime end is the reverse complement of the three prime end. And they are interspaced by what used to be thought as random DNA sequences, but later on analytics enabled us to tell that they were actually captured pieces of DNA from foreign genetic elements like plasmids and phages or viruses or bacteria and exogenous DNA. Now what CRISPR is in nature is the adaptive immune system of bacteria. So think about it as the antibody antigen equivalent that we have, all of us charming, complex, multi tissue, multicellular, multi-organ uh, 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 eukaryotes um, that use 3D protein, protein-based recognition of antibody antigens to mount immune response. CRISPR, in many ways, is the equivalent of that system conceptually in bacteria, but because they're unicellular, 
and they don't need to traffic proteins across different systems and organs and blood and lymph and the like, uh, this recognition is based on nucleic acid, nucleic acid interaction. And essentially it's DNA encoded, so CRISPR is on the DNAs, RNA mediated, small interfering RNAs mediated, think of siRNA but more CRISPR guides, and then more often than not DNA targeting. And the way they work as immune systems is a three-step process. There's a vaccination stage where a piece of DNA is copied and pasted, things like a, a, a mugshot or a snapshot or a Polaroid genetic picture of a piece of DNA that is invasive and is integrated into the CRISPR. That's one of those short sequences right here. And then once you get this integrated in the CRISPR, you're vaccinated. Okay, you've acquired a piece of exogenous DNA and this DNA is transcribed into small interfering RNA. You may have heard of guide RNAs, CRISPR guides. And those small interfering CRISPR RNAs guide Cas nucleases that enable very sequence specific double-stranded DNA breaks and DNA cleavage, endonucleolytic cleavage of the viral DNA. Now, there's a lot of different CRISPR-Cas systems in nature. I'm not going to talk about the analytics of the various CRISPR-Cas systems, how many genes are there, how dominant they are, and whatnot. The whole point is that there's a whole wealth of those tools that people can repurpose to do different things from a molecular biology standpoint. And the reason it's so exciting is because those CRISPRs coming from those genomes have been repurposed to now do what's called genome editing and per se, genome editing 2.0, because CRISPR didn't invent genome editing, it just enabled the Cas9-fueled genome editing craze we've been witnessing the last three years. And essentially what people have done is they've taken those molecular scissors, this molecular scalpel, that enables people to nick two, two strands of DNA precisely, programmably, affordably, multiplexably, conveniently, flexibly, quickly and precisely. So it's very powerful. For about $69, you can get a ad gene plasmid together with the guy that goes with it to cut any DNA sequence you want in any organism you want, like this. So it used to cost thousands of dollars, sometimes tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, and took weeks to months to do. Now it just takes a few days if you are equipped and keen and able to do so. Um, so this is what's enabling the genome editing technology and the link between CRISPR and genome editing is that once you have your Cas nuclease guided CRISPR RNA genesis of a double-stranded break, so you take your two strands of DNA and you nick each one, right? More often than not, when you have a DNA break, the cell is going to die. And cells, much like humans, don't like to die, and what they do is they harness or they redirect DNA repair machinery to patch that break back together. There's different ways to do that. One way is NHEJ, non-homologous end joining, which is like patching those back together with like duct tape, you know, like that, right? Like fishnet and sew it back up on the battlefield of genetic warfare. And you have kind of a, 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 a dirty either mutation or a small insertion of a deletion. Another way to do that repair is to use a template either elsewhere in your genome if you have two copies or similar copies of the same sequence elsewhere, or it is a user-provided template where you design a mutation, you design an insertion, or you design a deletion, and you change the sequence of your genome exactly at the point of the DNA break. And that's why it's called genome editing, because you can now search for any sequence of interest in your genome generate a break exactly, precisely, programmably, and specifically at the site of interest, and then you can rewrite the sequence right there using either repair pathway. That's the CRISPR-based genome editing craze executive summary. In the last three years, people have been able to implement and port that technology into almost any organism you can think of. If you just Google the CRISPR zoo, uh, you'll see all the great organisms in which people have been able to do that. It's impacted uh, the world of genetics and biology and, and all model organisms from viruses, bacteria, 
yeast, model organisms like fly and C. elegans, all the way to plants and monkeys and model systems in the middle for drug development, for example, uh, have been impacted and now it's trivialized. People, actually there's companies that sell tens of thousands of different mouse lines where each single coding sequence has been CRISPR edited, okay? Um, it has changed already the world of food and ag and then this is kind of where I come from, and you can think of like CRISPR chickens, or the white button mushroom, or waxy corn, or hornless cows already exist, right? So last year in some ways. Um, and the reason I'm here is really to talk about medicine. And it has really revolutionized the world of medicine in a very short amount of time, uh, because you can now go into any sequence of interest and change it. So you can go to DMD, and then Charlie Gersbach just did that on the street of Duke, and then rewrite the broken version of exon 23 skipping that results in the disease, in this case it's exon 23, in the disease of muscular dystrophy. And you can deliver, using retroviruses, CRISPR guides to the muscle cells of adult mice and make them grow back dystrophy to the point where I don't think they have the six minute walk test, maybe it's shorter for mice, um, but they actually have tangible translational results that are very promising moving into humans. And just this year, three different groups talked about that. Now you can do other things like removing viruses that are human cells, so people can remove HIV, inserted HIV out of human cells, and they can even vaccinate cells against future exposure to HIV. Uh, there's great, it's not like science fiction, but it's just science. There's great ways to actually humanize pigs to have donor tissues and organs for zero transplantations, right? And, and people like George Church and eGenesis do that. And they're probably less than a year away from having 37 distinct genome edits generated iteratively to kind of lower the chance they're going to have an organ transplant rejection. Um, and there's things like gene drives and, you know, essentially altering the, the genetic population of the mosquitoes that disseminates malaria, whereby you can actually render the whole population male, they can reproduce because they don't have CRISPRs, um, and then you can preclude the onset occurrence and dissemination of the mosquitoes that carry malaria. So there's many things you can do, and right now there's already clinical trials ongoing to actually pending test CRISPR-based gene therapies in humans in the U.S. and elsewhere. Now, I'm going to give you an actual example of, of what you can actually do with the data. Okay, so this is actually from corn. And you can take a CRISPR and you can say, I'm going to target this sequence in green right here or this sequence in green right here. I'm going to recognize the motif right here that's conserved. And then the cleavage site is going to be between the two base pairs in red. Okay, so you can see I'm going to cut my genome right here and I get all those sequences that are edited, all those sequences that are edited. And you can see that as long as you can do four or five variants thereof, you can insert an A, insert an T, insert a C, insert a G. Insert a T, insert a C, insert an A, insert a G, at almost equimolar amounts. So within a relatively short amount of time, if you can grow a couple dozen plants, you could select or screen for variants where you've changed surgically and precisely one base pair at a time. It's like science fiction, okay, except it's just science. And in cases, you can actually generate larger deletions or single base pair removal, and you can now rewrite the whole genome one base pair at a time. So if you have candidate SNPs for diseases like we heard this morning, you can go into cells and recapitulate, recapitulate them one at a time in any combinations possible. So this is now what we call navigating the genome. You can take any genome of interest in your big data set, and then say I'm gonna use my CRISPRs to target this particular sequence, make a cut right here, and then either insert, delete, remove, add, or change any letter I want in the book of life. So you have three billion base pairs in the human genome, and you can say I'm going to programmably, specifically, and affordably go right here, and I'm going to rewrite that A to something else, or remove it, or change it, or insert something there. That's the power of the genome editing revolution. Now, one of the things that CRISPR is enabling us to do as well 
is to look at microbiome. Okay, so still related to health, still related to drugs, but let's talk about bacteria for a minute. So if you take a bacterium, this is a bacterium, this is a CRISPR locus of the bacterium, I've removed all the sequences that look alike, all the repeats, and we only look at the spacers. And any given two color combination is a unique sequence that was acquired as part of the vaccination process. Think of that as the vaccination card, right? Time going from right to left. And essentially this strain, right, in a mixed population has been vaccinated 32 times. And what people do is that this strain has been exposed to a virus. When it's exposed to this virus and becomes resistant to this virus, it gets vaccinated by acquiring this immune marker right here. Take that variant, it's being exposed to a second virus, and it's acquiring a second marker. Take this one, exposed to a third virus, it's acquiring a third marker, and so on and so forth. And you can vaccinate a strain over time by building its vaccination record. This is the last wild type at the top right here. And you have one event, second event, third event, and a fourth event. So now what you can do with CRISPRs is you can just sequence one portion of the genome of a bacterium in a mixed population and tell who it is, where it's been, and how many bad decisions it's made over time. Now, you can take that out and look at mixed populations. So in this particular case, we're looking at C. diff. Each line is one C. diff isolate from a different patient. This is the old ancestral vaccination profile that they all share. And then over time, different isolates from different patients in different parts of the world and or different hospitals and or different nations and or different regions have had their own distinct vaccination card. And we can use data analytics by just sequencing one locus in a whole genome. So we're not looking at two to five megs, we're looking at two to five KB. So it's a thousand times less data to sequence, a thousand times less data to look at. And we can retrace where a strain come from, and we can tell those three guys are the same, and they've had two vaccination events that differentiate from this guy, and then this guy shares this history with those guys, and then those guys share this history with those guys. And you can trace back the history of CDF isolates over time. Now you can step back and then do that in hundreds of different CDF isolates. You can do that into different serotypes. You can do that into different genotypes of, of CDF, and those are the various sequence types that are relevant. They have between two and 12 different CRISPR loci, and we can retrace the history and say those are all the same, but this one is a new vaccination event. This one shares the vaccination in the history of all those guys, but has this difference here. Sometimes we have deletion events, sometimes we have addition events, sometimes we have combinations thereof. So we can go back to CDF on a global basis and then sequence those CRISPRs and tell within mixed populations where they come from and where they've been. And we can superimpose that data on SNP files, whole genome files, or even maps. And we can retrace over time using the data that we get, the metadata that we get, where strains come from, where they've been, and how they compare and contrast to one another. This is how you can diagnose the type of CDF infection that you have. You could do that with Chipotle, for example. You can do that with E. coli, we've done that with Salmonella. You can do that with almost pathogen that you have that has an active CRISPR-Cas system. And then in the end, you can actually go back to specific hospitals and regions. This is Denmark. They seem to have a problem with C. diff in Denmark. And you can go back and say, this is the ancestral parent, and this one has had two additions here, this one has had deletions here, this one has two multiple additions here. And you can backtrack which variant from the same ancestral clone has gone to what particular island and or what particular hospital, and maybe someone came in that year. So you can actually backtrack to the person and or the location and or combination thereof that disseminated that disease. Now, together with this, this last example is now we can just not just understand CRISPR or change the genomes or unravel in microbiomes, but we can actually use CRISPR to design drugs that are specific antibiotics. And one thing that I mentioned is that this concept of repairing the genome is great in eukaryotes. So plants and humans are great at repairing broken genomes. Bacteria are terrible at repairing their genome. Okay, they're not incentivized to do so. If you want to talk about that, you can talk about that over lunch. Hopefully not over a uh, uh, spoiled lunch, clearly. Um, but what you can do is you can now use CRISPR 
and say target an E. coli, in this case, say if E. coli, we can do the same for a pathogenic E. coli, and say, I'm going to use CRISPR to generate a break somewhere in that genome. And regardless of what you target, coding, non-coding, plus, minus, essential gene, non-essential gene, you're going to kill 99.999% of all the cells because they can't repair their genome. Okay? And if you multiplex that, you kill 99.999 to the power x, okay? or the power n if you like mathematics better. And you can, you can develop a very sequence-specific antimicrobial that allows you to selectively remove one genotype from a microbiome but leave the rest alone, aka not use a broad-spectrum antibiotic that wipes out not just the infectious agent, but also the whole microbiome. Oh, and by the way, screens for antimicrobial resistance. We've been doing this experiment for 50 years, and we know where that got us. So what's interesting about CRISPR is not just that it's very lethal, but actually you can program using big data, the specificity with which you're going to target a certain genotype. So you can take two E. coli strains that are 99.9% .9 identical, and they say, I'm going to kill one or the other or both. So you can use your SNP knowledge, your understanding of genetic diversity, to selectively, precisely, and programmably say, I'm going to use that SNP that's unique to that genotype to remove it. And in cases where you have 99% identity, no problem. You can modulate that down and say, I'm going to take things like E. coli and salmonella, do a core genome map, sequence, and find sequences in loci that are unique to that shared genotype, but that is different from every other bacteria and say I can now kill just E. coli or salmonella or both. And depending on how you deliver it, you can have a dose response killing efficiency and you can go into a microbiome that has multiple different species and say I'm going to change the quantitative ratio of one species to the other, enabling you to do microbiome engineering and alter the composition qualitatively and quantitatively of your mixed population. So altogether, I think this is a good example of how the CRISPR elements or the CRISPR tools come from big data, come from genomes, and genomes begot us CRISPR, and CRISPR has enabled the genesis of gene therapies and next generation drugs like DMD, possibly HIV and other viruses and xenotransplantations to cure humans of genetic diseases, notwithstanding the static genome more often than not. And then also CRISPRs can be used to generate diagnostics of infectious bacterial pathogenic agents in food, in infections, and in microbiome. And in the end, you can use the microbiome to target select CRISPR to alter the microbiome, target select genomes, and kill those. So we've almost gone full circle. We're not quite there yet. I added a slide at the break because we heard about velocity this morning, the velocity and pace at which things are changing, which is mind-boggling in many ways. So I felt compelled to talk about this. I gave my first talk on CRISPR in 2007. The whole literature was 27 papers, like the, the Sunday newspaper, depending on your appetite for CRISPR literature. And, and within about one PhD cycle, depending on where you go to school and how good you are or not, <laughs> it was like the pre-CRISPR craze. It took much longer. but. Um, you know, the literature went from like one paper a month to one paper a week to one paper a day to multiple papers a day. Just last year, 1,200 CRISPR papers got published. Think about that. It's just mind-boggling, right? Like the, the, the dynamics and the pace at which things are happening, the velocity is just amazing. Last year, almost 24,000 CRISPR constructs got shipped by AdGene. That's 2,000 a month. That's 500 a week. That's 100 per work day. A hundred labs per work day get a new CRISPR construct. That's so last year, by the way. Okay? And then it's been shipped to about 61 countries to date. Right? Do that at dinner tonight. Make a list of 61 countries you think are using CRISPR. I think that's going to keep you busy for a while, right? So altogether, I think this is very, very compelling. I want to acknowledge the work of many people who are doing that. And I think I'll take uh, five minutes for questions because we started five minutes late. Thank you. It's CRISPR. Can I have a question? What does the delivery system for CRISPR look like when you're introducing it to the microbiome? Is it into a bacterial strain and it's that? And so, the, so the best way to actually deliver them to a specific host is to use phages as delivery vehicles. And how is that? Where is that right now? It's moving along. I mean, the microbiome pretty well, but if you feed it to an adult animal, how does that 
how effects, I mean, what's the penetrance? Do you get to every cell? Are you, I mean... So depending on your type of infection, right? So, so let's say if you have a lung disease, you would have to have a spray. If you have an intestinal disease, you have to have an enema and oil delivery. And if you have a skin disease, like if you have MRSA, you would do a topical. So the mode of delivery and the, the quantitative considerations for delivery and ratios and diversity of the microbiome depend on the infectious agent. So right now we're working on CDF and E. coli, for example, for intestinal diseases, and we do you know high titer phage preps. And we've shown already, I couldn't have the data today because I didn't know if I was going to get a question about microbiomes. <laughs> but, but we have translational valid impact that enables death of the large majority of infectious bacteria in a, in a sepsis model, for example. People have shown uh, MRSA as well on the skin in animal models in Nature Biotech last year. So there's a couple of studies, only three studies to date, that show that it's viable uh, but no work in humans as of yet. So would it be DMD first? I mean, that I mean so, well, so DMD first, if you think of the tunnel that you can get to get commercial and phase one and phase two and successful phase three is pending, mm -hmm. right? It's going to take a long time to get there, uh, but they have a very strong head start. Um, I think microbiome applications are going to have a shorter lifespan regulatory path, maybe an easier regulatory path. Uh, so I think though DMD is ahead right now, and actually ex vivo diseases and immunotherapies are the easiest to deliver to because it's blood as opposed to muscle. So it's easy to inject things in blood, obviously. Uh, and the eye disease, some, some retina diseases are easy to inject to locally. Uh, but I do think that the microbiome in the end might win that race for genetic diseases. Now, if you think about genome editing overall outside of human health, mm -hmm. I mean, we've already seen the white button mushroom. So the browning gene the gene responsible for the browning of white mushrooms, white button mushrooms, has been knocked out using CRISPR. And you can now have white button mushrooms that stay white. So now it makes human healthier. It's not a medicine per se, depending on what you do with mushrooms. We'll talk about that. Um, but that, that may win the race to your plate. And if you have that at the hospital, it's going to cure you, but you can still enjoy it. <laughs> and at the same time, uh, Pioneer has already as shown, you can use the same concept to generate waxy corn. So depending on how you like your corn and not like your corn, you can alter the phenotype of the corn kernels using CRISPR knockouts. And, and this, is, this has been done already. So I think the genome editing race outside of human health may make its way to ag already. I mentioned the hornless cows, so you don't have to cut their horns or butcher them whatsoever. You can just make them, you know, more copacetic, so to speak, in manufacturing. Great stuff. So we could go on all afternoon, but I think we need to move on to our next speaker. Um, what? And uh, what, as you're closing up, would you like to tell everybody about the conference you're doing in a few days? So next week on Thursday the 20th, there will be a microbiome all-day conference at NC State at the McKinnon Center. We'll forward the information to the listserv. Thank you. Sure, everybody. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.